The story you're about to hear was told to me in the strictest of confidence. Certain names, dates and locations have been changed to protect that confidence. Events that feature in this story may be part of the public record. If you believe you recognise any of the people, places or events that appear in this story, ask you not to reveal any information publicly, out of respect for the subject's right to remain anonymous. My name is David Paul Nixon, and this is the New Ghost Stories Podcast, where we delve into the New Ghost Stories archive to hear new and classic cases of the supernatural. Stories that could be delusions, lies, fantasies, or perhaps even the real thing. Just don't make your mind up until you've listened. How much choice do we have about what happens to us in our own lives? Is it all about the choices we make? Do we decide every turn on the path we take? Or is it all mapped out already? Do we each of us have our own destiny? Does everything really happen for a reason? I don't think I can offer anything to a debate about whether free will exists or not, but I know at various times in my life, and more often as I hit middle age, that I find myself haunted. Not by the ghosts of the past that we often deal with on this podcast, but haunted by the things that I didn't do, haunted by the futures that never came to be. I think we all sometimes ruminate on those sliding doors moments, where through some mistake, some misunderstanding, or through playing it safe, we missed some great opportunity. An opportunity that could have put our lives on an entirely different trajectory and would have put us in a better place than we find ourselves in now. If something good happens to us, then it was meant to be. If it doesn't, well, everything happens for a reason. It must be for some greater good, right? Or could it be that we've just missed our chance, made a bad decision, Right royally fucked things up. We had another opportunity for a better life and we simply blew it. Destiny is for the young. As you get older there are fewer mistakes you can afford to make. Fewer chances to change the course of your life. No one wants to think as they grow up and grow old that their destiny was to fail. Or that they were always meant to fail to end up wondering where it all went wrong, haunted by all the things that never came to be. If there is such a thing as destiny, then it's obvious that not everyone gets to have a great destiny. And if everything is meant to be, how hard must it be to accept that you are meant to fail? To be someone who loses. If we do have choices, and we do genuinely have control over the path we take, then there must be still some hope for us, a chance that we can change course. But then it's all down to us. We have to make sure that we make the right choices and make our own opportunities before our time starts to run out. And if we fail, we fail. There is no way back, no guiding hand, and no time to lose. This is New Ghost Stories case number 475 and it's called Remember This and you can hear it in full, uninterrupted, after these messages. Just a note to say that the narrator of this story is female. Working at a small university out in the home counties means you don't get access to the best acts. I was still a wide-eyed and ambitious girl when I started. I was sure I could draw in bands and comedians on the way to London, persuade them to make a stop at our students' union on the way. Three for two on all shots before 9pm, lads. And pint of snake-biting black for three pounds. 
come on over. The prospectus made a big deal about all the big acts that had played at the student union. It just didn't mention how long ago they played there, and it was only ever a list of about three anyway. I was trying to get exciting, up-and-coming, cool acts to play there. I was sure at least newish bands would be interested in performing. But none of the promoters would have it. The best we could get were pop idol runners-up from two years back and members of bands who'd broken up in the 90s. I needed to change the image of the place to persuade promoters to bring in the talent, but because I couldn't get any talent, I couldn't change the image of the place. I'd made some big promises in my interview about getting bigger and better acts. I was really worried I was going to get in trouble because I was failing. Over time, however, I came to realise that no one was really that bothered. None of the students seemed to object to the repeated school discos and 80s nights. The place was always packed out. But they didn't really have anywhere else to go in that small town. So what choice did they have? I remember it was a wet Sunday evening in November when this whole bizarre thing went down. Things were a mess. A weekend-long art fair had been going on. Art and design students got to put on a show every term to show off what they were working on. Hypothetically, they could sell their works too, but I don't remember that ever happening. Normally this was done during the week, but some genius had had the idea to hold it over the weekend. Someone in events should have flagged it as an issue, but I suppose none of us thought to. Can't have pieces of art hanging around when you've got pissed up students about on a Saturday night. No one had thought about what we were supposed to do with the artworks between Saturday and Sunday morning. Most of the offices were locked, so we were keeping things in corridors and up against the fire exits, breaking all sorts of health and safety rules. We really had no idea what we were doing. Come Sunday evening, most of the pieces were gone, but a couple of them were hung high from the ceiling, and we had to leave them there. The caretaker who had the ladder had it locked away and no one had the key. As the students ambled in, they were greeted by this huge papier-mâché angel hanging over the steps down from the entrance door. It was made out of Monopoly money. Not the most subtle metaphor, but pretty impressive due to the scale of it. Its wingspan was huge. It was a weird evening. Those who turned out had come to see a variety act called The Magic of the Music Hall. This was not my idea. We were sometimes obliged with certain agencies to take several of their acts as a package. I can only imagine this is how we'd ended up with this creaky variety showcase. I suppose Britain's Got Talent was on TV by then, but I just didn't see the students going for it. I was sure we'd been fobbed off with a cruise ship act. Generally, we did something a bit less boozy for Sundays so the students were more fresh for Monday morning. But this was a weird pitch. It wasn't like those ironic nostalgia acts, old kids presenters going blue and sending themselves up. The students had no kind of connection to this very, very old school stuff. It wasn't edgy or ironic. But my predecessor had inked the deal, so I was stuck with it. It was half full that night. It could have been worse. And to be fair to the show, it was not as bad as I was expecting it to be. The performers could actually perform. They were talented and knew how to interact with a crowd. The compere came on first and he did the usual and where have you come from tonight, sir, material. It was self-consciously old-fashioned in a way that sort of worked. The guy knew how to work the audience and think on his feet. He chucked in some innuendos and did some stuff about what students are like, which went down fine. I'd seen the lineup, and there were two acts I was particularly nervous about. The first came right at the start, a dog trainer. I had no idea how this was going to go down. Students, they can go either way. Cheesy can be good, or cheesy can just be cheesy, and god-awful, and embarrassing. 
that I thought it was going to be the latter. The trainer came on, did a bit first about how her partner was a diva, and made a big show of ordering her on stage before finally revealing her partner to be a trained poodle. The dog came on, walking on her hind legs and with a huge beehive wig. The laughter was awkward. They were all asking themselves whether this was actually happening. But you can do a lot with cute dogs. Fifi had a partner, Fido, and together they performed action sequences. Fifi jumping from a burning building, Fido driving along in a little pedal-powered fire truck, and then using the hose, a water pistol, to put out the fire, which was a smoke machine. She did it. She won them over with the sheer silliness of it. It went from bad cheesy to good cheesy, and she got a big round of applause afterwards. It is hard not to like dogs. On next was the hypnotist. This was safer ground. Students are well up for mutual ridicule. They were laughing in the aisles as the hypnotist had men barking like dogs, friends believing the planet was about to be invaded by aliens, and one girl kicking off because she thought her boyfriend was sleeping with her grandmother. People were having fun. I was relieved. The bar take would be enough to make the whole thing worthwhile. I slipped out before the first half finished to go there ahead of the queue and treated myself to a Bacardi breezer. I thought I could relax, that it was all going to be fine. I enjoyed about two swigs before everything went to shit. The rugby club arrived. The loudest, heaviest drinking bunch of bastards at the university. They're all built like tanks, so they think they can throw their weight around. And they were right. Security was mostly afraid of them, so they knew they could get away with being a bunch of noisy, abusive, intimidating arseholes. Most of them were posh too. The entitlement was strong with these fuckers. There were six of them with their girlfriends along for the ride, and they were already drunk. Of all the events they decided to turn up to, they were still selling tickets on the door, of course. They'd come just because we were open. I looked at the two guys on the door. Maybe if the chess club had turned up hammered, they could handle it. What were they going to do if these guys got too rowdy? They sat themselves around a table at the back during the interval. The compere came back on to do his ten minutes, and they gave him a few heckles. He shot back well, and they took it in the right spirit. Things were still okay. But then the next act came on. That was the one that I was really worried about. The memory act. I'd seen the guy backstage beforehand. Out of all of them, he looked the most like he might have actually been alive when the music hall was in its prime. Unlike the kind of exaggerated, cheap, glitzy outfits the other acts were wearing, his tux and bow tie and white gloves all looked completely authentic. He was getting on in years. He was completely bald, neckless, and very white. He looked like a boiled egg on legs. He came on stage and immediately the rugby team started to give what the fuck is this looks to each other. Ladies and gentlemen, he had quite the voice. It travelled well. I am the man memorizer, a walking human encyclopedia, a titan of trivia, a fountain of facts, a never ending repository of knowledge. You, sir, he pointed to a man sitting near to the front with his white gloved finger. Enjoy your football, young sir? Fabulous. And tell me, sir, who is your favourite team? He said Manchester United to a chorus of boos. I won't hold that against you, sir, I promise. Ask me a question about Manchester United. Any question you like, sir. What the guy could come up with was, when did Alex Ferguson become manager? Become manager? Oh, try a hard one, sir. That would have been back in 1986, that would. To the day it was the 6th of November, 1986. Am I right, sir? The kid nodded, assuming he even knew the answer. 
Lost his first game 2-0. Did you know that, sir? The kid shook his head. Who wants to ask me a hard one? You, madam. Who do you support? She supported Chelsea and asked how long Chelsea's unbeaten record was. Ah, the Chelsea record. He made a show of trying hard to recall it by looking up to the ceiling and creasing his forehead. That's, I believe, madam, would be... 86 league matches. Am I right? She nodded, and he clapped his gloved hands together. Loud enough for everyone to hear, one of the rugby guys said, Is this it? Another student ventured a question. How many times was Zinedine Sedan caught offside? The man memorizer clicked his fingers. Sir, you know that is a trick question. Zinedine Zidane was never caught offside, came a shout from the rugby table. The man memoriser twisted around on his heels. Manifax yourself, sir. Nah, mate, use Google. He held up his phone and his table started laughing. That's a shame, sir, said the man memoriser, sounding a little stung. Better to keep in the spirit of things. He turned his back to the rugby team. Now geography, that's a good one. Who here is good on their international knowledge? You, sir, you look game. Ask me a question about the nations of the world. Anything you like, sir. The man took a moment and then mumbled something. Bit louder for the audience, sir. Nervously, he asked. What's the only country in the world that begins with an O? The only country in the world to begin with an O. That was the question. There were mutterings from amongst the rugby crew. That would be Oman, they shouted. Would be the one, said the man memoriser, peeved but keeping it together. Let's have another one. A girl sitting nearby shouted to him. Right, a question from the young lady. Which country has the most capital cities? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, there are indeed countries with more than one capital city. South Africa. The answer is South Africa, he said, with three capital cities, Cape Town, Pretoria, Pretoria, and Bloemfontein, Bloemfontein, he finished. The rugby players were laughing. This was getting out of hand. The man was rattled. He swivelled around and walked over to the hecklers. Perhaps, sirs, you would like to ask a question. Don't need to, mate. Can Google it. I can ask Siri. They all laughed. The guy didn't know what to do. I slipped behind the curtain that encircled the auditorium and headed to get security. I could only find one solitary man stood at the entrance and he said he couldn't leave the door. I told him to send his partner as soon as he got back from wherever he'd gone. When I returned, the man memoriser was on stage with a blackboard striking chalk against it and drawing a grid. Mathematics, ladies and gentlemen. Numbers, they can unlock the secrets of the universe. Is he doing sums now? shouted one of the rugby players. The strikes on the chalkboard got louder. I got a calculator too, mate. You want to borrow it? More laughter. I couldn't wait for security. I went over to them and hissed. Stop it. Leave him alone. They made the uh sound and all laughed. God, it was so awkward. Besides the rugby players, the room was dead silent, awkwardly quiet. There was such a tense atmosphere now. Then the poor guy, he dropped his chalk. He bent down to get it and suddenly cried out. That cry, that painful cry reverberated around the silent room. He grabbed onto the chalkboard. Poor bastard, he'd put his back out. There was some sniggering from the rugby team. The man tried to stand up straight, but he couldn't. He looked at the audience. Were his eyes watering, or were those tears in his eyes? Wincing with his right hand on his hip, he walked slowly, slightly bent, off stage. The silence was so uncomfortable. Fuck the rugby guys, everyone else just felt bad for the guy at this point. 
I thought about going backstage to find out what was going on. But then the compare came back out and said to the audience, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid Brian has had a little accident. I think he's going to be fine. These things happen. I think we should give a round of applause to him. The man memorizer. What a brain. What an incredible memory. The audience sympathetically managed to whip up a bit of noise for the guy, in defiance of the rugby guys, who just stayed quiet. But by then, someone from security had finally dragged themselves over there and told them to keep it down. Better late than never. The compare does his spiel a bit more. It's too late though, the damage is done, and the mood can't be recovered. The final act is the magician. Classic stuff mostly. Card tricks, rings passed through other rings, swords plunged into a barrel, assistant magically unharmed. It's fine, the applause is polite, but the night is done. I think we were all glad when it was over. I went backstage afterwards. I felt I should at least apologise for how those dicks had behaved. See if the guy was okay as well. But I couldn't see him. I asked a few people. They said he'd taken his painkillers and had gone to lie down. When I asked where, no one seemed to know. I was worried about the feedback. The last thing I needed was the place getting a bad rep for the audience. I was feeling dejected, miserable. The show was done by 10pm, but the bar was open till 11. I went to get myself a drink, but was repulsed to find the rugby club still there. They'd be here for as long as they could still get served. I decided I'd go back to the kitchen and dull my senses in private. But as I was leaving the bar area, I saw him, the man memorizer, appearing as if from nowhere. He must have had great painkillers. His posture was perfect now. He was immaculately turned out once again in his tux and bow tie and gloves. I was about to ask him how he was doing, but he strode ahead of me and approached the table of rugby players, looking like the self-assured maitre d' of an expensive restaurant. He stood behind the chunkiest of the players, and waited for the drunks to notice he was standing there. When the chunky guy, who looked like he could fell trees with his biceps, turned to him, the man memorizer pointed with his finely gloved hand and said, Aged 42, from stomach cancer. No diagnosis until it's too late. Tragic, sir. Truly tragic. What? said the guy, looking to his friends and then back again. Your death, sir. At age 42. No age at all, sir. Truly, truly terrible. He turned to the guy's girlfriend, a brunette in a low-cut top. Now you, madam, you fare a little better, but I'd be careful of the drinking. You're due an accident, my dear. Might not be inevitable, if you're careful. What the fuck are you saying to her? Said Chunky, standing up and knocking his stool over. It's a funny thing, memory, sir the man memorizer said, standing his ground. I have an immaculate memory, water tight. I can look back across my life the way you'd flick through a book, sir. I can go through it, take it day by day, and recall everything that happened on every given date, sir. All the facts and all the figures, all the things I did and didn't do, I can open up my mind and it's all right there for me to see and I flick through those pages many times over and over. So many times that, in fact, sir, one day, he put his hand on Chunky's shoulder, leaning in as if to pass on a secret. I asked myself, I said, Brian, what if you could flick forward as well as back? What if this incredible memorizing brain of mine could look at the pages ahead to see what's going to happen in the future? as well as in the past. And I saw that I could remember. He patted the man on his shoulder, leant back out and swivelled to the left. He pointed to another rugby player, a tall skinhead, and said, Now you, sir, I'm happy to report you will die at a grand old age, though it is a shame what happens to your children. Tragic, 
and to both of them too. Now you, madam, he pointed to a blonde. She'd picked up on what was going on, and she made a shriek. Shut your fucking mouth, thundered Chunky, moving to grab him. Never stay together with a violent man, miss. Chunky grabbed the man memorizer by the collar. You'll only come to harm. Don't you talk to her, you weird fuck. And then finally security intervened. Bravely, both guards took an arm each and ordered Chunky to let the man memorizer go. The man memorizer took a moment to straighten his collar and bow tie. Then he clapped his hands together. Now, two of you will die by your own hand. Who'd like to have a go at guessing who the suicides are? The rest of the players jumped to their feet. The security guards, barely able to handle Chunky, looked panicked. The man memorizer raised his hands. All right, all right. A showman knows when to listen to his audience. He knows when it's time to leave the stage. He started off towards the entrance to the Union, and the security guards moved to block anyone who had come after him. He walked to the top of the steps and turned once more to the hostile crowd. Now I know what you're thinking, ladies and gentlemen. You think this is some kind of trick, that I have come here to deceive and unnerve and spread terrifying untruths as a petty, vindictive form of entertainment. Arms now outstretched, he bellowed. Well, I can assure you, every word I've said tonight is the God's honest truth. And if I have led you astray or been dishonest with you in any way, may the Lord himself strike me down. He stood, arms still out to his sides, for a silent moment. Then we all heard the sound, a loud snap and the crack of a whip. The papier-mâché angel swooped down from the ceiling. The wires holding it at the top had broken, but its feet were still tethered. It flipped upside down, its wings sending a rush of air across the room. There were screams from the girls. The other cable snapped. The angel crashed to the floor. It landed on its head, which was crushed under its weight. Then the body tipped over into the bar, its legs and wings knocking over bar tables and chairs as it hit the floor. Even the bulkiest of the rugby team jumped a full step back. And slowly together, we all looked back up at the stairs where the man memorizer stood, pieces of broken cables dangling in front of him. He was in exactly the same spot, cool and calm, still in the same pose. Well, he said, dropping his arms to his sides, it appears to have missed. Who could have predicted that? Good night! He gave his audience a sweeping bow before turning on his heels and exiting the Union. Thank you for listening to the New Ghost Stories podcast. If you've enjoyed the podcast and want to support what I do, please like, comment or leave a review on any platform and subscribe to hear future releases. You can also support the show by becoming a patron and visiting patreon.com slash new ghost stories. The show is written and produced by me, David Paul Nixon. If you'd like to read more from me, visit my substack, newghoststories.substack.com. And you can also find me on Instagram, threads, Mastodon, Facebook, and the website formerly known as Twitter, at New Ghost Stories. Next time on the new Ghost Stories podcast, it's so stressful trying to get to the airport on time. <laughs> <laughs>